very much, everyone, for staying uh, to the end. Um, I know there's a bar that apparently serves very good margaritas uh, downstairs. And uh, also, before I start uh, actually uh, talking, I'd like to thank uh, Pascal again uh, and uh, to assure her that uh, I'd be delighted to co-organize another conference with her. <laughs> <laughs> with this, uh, it's been fantastic, and uh, it's just been a wonderful uh, few days so far. Um, this is a, a project that I've been working on with a wide range of uh, people uh, for quite some time uh, now. Um, actually, interestingly, motivated this particular problem by agreeing to do a PhD oral in, uh, in France, in Grenoble. Uh, I went to do a PhD oral, of, I mentioned the student uh, has worked later, Estelle Guillez, and I thought the experiment was so interesting that we, I went back to Cambridge and we built one. And uh, then the sequence of people, Andy Woods, uh, Andrea Custers, Julian Landell, did some preliminary experiments. Then Rosie Oglethorpe did her PhD. And then it, this project really got entrained into this uh, stratified turbulence project that Paul was talking about between Cambridge, that we're involved in between Cambridge and Bristol, led by uh, Paul. And so Pierre Augier, who was one of the postdocs on that, and Jamie Partridge, who's now postdoc, have been doing some very nice uh, experiments with, of course, the assistance of Stuart Diel, and we've had some very um, talented and enthusiastic uh, French um, uh, interns come over and uh, do some uh, experiments that confused us uh, further. Mm -hmm. So because this is um, uh, late in the day and we've all got laptops and internet and so on, uh, I just thought I'd give you uh, the alternative title to give you the executive summary of what this is actually all about, and I want to quote that uh, famous... Um, uh, philosopher Mike Tyson, right? And, and so uh, if he was a fluid dynamicist, he'd say everyone has a theory until they get the experimental data, right? And uh, that's really what's happening in this uh, talk. We, have some we had some beautiful theories. We thought everything was made sense. And then we made the terrible mistake of taking the data at higher resolution. And I would say to any of the young members in the audience, if you publish a paper in JFM, with low resolution data, do not go back to the same experiment and get high resolution <laughs> data. <laughs> Move on. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, the fundamental question that we have uh, uh, for stratified turbulent flow, as far as I'm concerned, is always this picture, which many of you have seen uh, before. If we have turbulence, how much does the turbulence mix the profile? If you start off with the linear profile, does it give you a well-mixed uh, layer with strong interfaces? A w less well-mixed layer with less strong interfaces, or does it do nothing at all? And really, this connects to something that actually dates back uh, uh, to uh, Phillips, not the Phillips 72 paper, Phillips 69 paper, where really the issue is what kind of mixing do you have? Do you have something that is appropriately described as a diffusive process, that you mix the fluid and you overturn an interface, and so you end up with a layer of intermediate density, and this is kind of ending up diffusing from being just white and just blue to having the intermediate color? Or do you maintain those interfaces and scour or, or polish those interfaces and yet still have vertical transport of uh, fluid? And this is really uh, obviously a fundamental question uh, for many applications, I just love this uh, picture uh, from this uh, recent paper by Haran et al. These are measurements, temperature measurements, four and a half kilometers down in the ocean off Sierra Leone at different times, and they show 250-odd Kelvin Helmholtz billows in the temperature signal, four and a half kilometers down. So these sort of shear mixing processes are going on, and uh, are they overturning interfaces, or are they uh, scouring interfaces? And really, uh, this was uh, um, G.I. Taylor's hard problem. Uh, the, the Taylor uh, cuddle fuddle uh, instability was first introduced in this uh, particular paper, uh, but he actually did the calculations uh, 100 years ago, in 1914, just when the war was uh, breaking out. But during the war years, it was laid aside. And since then, I have delayed publication, hoping to be able to undertake experiments designed to verify or otherwise the results. So he found shear instabilities, but he couldn't get the experiments to work. And that's a very important uh, uh, concept I want you to uh, hold in your mind as I go on through what I'm talking about. And, but this is a mechanism by which you can mix fluids. And resonating with much of what's been talked about so far, I want to say layers are generic. 
and the importance of Prandtl number or Schmidt number is key to what's going on. Because if you have uh, two fluids of different uh, uh, velocities, the shear layer that develops can be thought to be associated with some diffusion of an er error function, so it will spread out like the square root of time by the viscosity. The density distribution will square it spread out like the square root of time by the diffusivity of whatever is causing the density. So if you work out the Richardson number of such a flow, whatever the bulk things you have and the, the ratio of scales, the key determinant is this uh, exponential, which has at its heart the ratio of scales. So if you're in a gas or a numerical simulation and your Prandtl number is 1, that means the two, two diffusivities are roughly the same size. That means Rd squared is less than 2. That means this bracket is negative. That means this whole bracket is positive. That means the exponential rapidly grows from the value it has at the midpoint of the shear layer. And you have this sort of picture. Shear layer with density profile roughly the same sky, scale. And the Richardson number is largest at the middle. On the other hand, if you have a Prandtl number that is uh, substantially larger than 1, so therefore Rd squared is greater than 2, the term in the bracket is positive, the term in the square bracket is therefore negative, so no matter how strong your bulk Richardson number is, you will have regions of weaker stratification, I re weaker Richardson number, either side of a strong density gradient. That changes the character of the shear instability that you will see from the Kelvin-Helmholtz. This is what you have if the two scales match. You get turbulence and it breaks down to having the sort of Hombo instability, like Paul's beautiful experiments. Sharp density interfaces, vortices above and below, propagate along, can cause instability. But whichever one you have, if you start off, if you look at the way such instabilities, this is time on this axis, this is the vertical distribution of the horizontal average of the uh, buoyancy frequency. If you have a spread out layer and you have a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, you end up with strong region of gradient, strong region of gradient, weak region of gradient, i.e., you make a layer with two interfaces because of this big overturning. If you start off with Hombo, you start off with a sharp interface. You scat the turbulence basically scours around a sharp interface in the middle, and the interface survives. So you end up, what I what want to argue is, you have a layering in this situation, and you want to understand the mixing properties of layering dynamics. The problem is, the scale of this layer is given by the size of the billow. The scale of the layer with the hombo, well, the hombo doesn't change it, so it's what you've originally imposed. That's not very satisfactory. It's not generic. So can we come to a situation where we have a generic uh, uh, mechanism by which layers are formed? And we can, because we can do G.I. Taylor's easy problem. Because, and this, he, so 23, he did this after the KH, uh, to the, the Taylor-Goldstein problem, but he did it because, this is the first sentence of the paper, the object with which this work was undertaken was to search for a mathematical solution of some case of fluid instability which can conveniently be subjected to experimental investigation. He identified a flow where you could get a good agreement, a stunning agreement, between the experimental measurements of instability onset, the little dots, and the theoretical prediction of a linear instability in terms of uh, Bessel functions and funky uh, uh, integration. So analytically, he predicted the existence of this curve for marginal stability, and experimentally it agreed perfectly. And so this was a very, very nicely controlled flow that sh gave you instabilities. And so we decided, right, let's do this flow because it could give us the possibility of having an awful lot of energetic motions in a stratified fluid that still doesn't impo necessarily impose a particular overturning scale. So we, i.e. that cast of thousands I described, have done a sequence of experiments on stratified taylor coet flow. So we've always had 50 centimetres nominal wide tanks, but because of the width of uh, the perspex and so on, 24.7 centimetre internal radius, that RO or R2 on this particular picture. We've had three different cylinders, 5, 10, and 15 centimetres uh, wide. So for aficionados, we've never been in the, thin ga the small value of the radius ratio where you would expect the external tank not to matter. 
nor in the very large value of radius ratio close to one, where you're approximating plane correct flow. We've always got a nice wide gap. For all the experiments I'll tell you we're about, we're never driving the outer cylinder, so we're always strongly centrifugally unstable and strongly turbulent. And so when you do PIV, whatever the internal diameter of the, the internal radius, I'll try and have it so that the blues are always five, the reds are always 10, and the greens are always 15. The angular momentum, i.e. the azimuthal velocity multiplied by the radius, is very close to constant in this uh, experiment. Uh, pose, apart from at little uh, boundary layers, and it is scaled in each case with omega r1 squared, i.e. the velocity, uh, the, the, sorry, the angular momentum of the inner cylinder. So to a good approximation, the fluid is going at a speed half times the inner cylinder at the inner wall. It then drops like 1 over r outwards, and then it goes to zero at the outer boundary. Very turbulent from the beginning, Inherently uh, uh, far from transition, but it, there are stability, insta linear instabilities, and it's got horizontal shear, and it's inherently three-dimensional from the start. So this is profoundly three-dimensional, profoundly non-linear, and we, if we start off with an initial linear stratification, what happens? Now, typically, we do... So we're going to scale all our times with omega t, and typically we do about one radian a second. So you, in the non-dimensional terms of omega t, it's about, it, or omega t equals one is about one second. So you can get some idea. Initial linear stratification, and this is what the density profile does spontaneously. And that's about after about an hour, and f an hour and a half after that one, the layers are still have got very char similar characteristic structure, very similar uh, setup. We spontaneously see layers develop in this flow that is profoundly turbulent. So, what is the physical mechanism is a question, and what is, any, is linear theory relevant to determine anything at all in this problem? At, at substantially lower Reynolds number that wasn't so clearly turbulent, Bobnov et al., which, God rest his soul, he, wor he was working with uh, uh, Emil Hopfinger. Emil Hopfinger then was with Jan Bert Flohr, and it was Jan Bert Flohr's student, uh, Estelle Guiez, who gave me this uh, introduction to this whole problem. But we see beautiful formation of layers and interfaces. And this goes on as long as the grad student is prepared to watch the experiment. <laughs> this is a six-hour stream of a tank that's 50 centimeters deep. And you see there is the somewhat of what Bill was talking about. You know, there's erosion from the side because we had no flux boundary conditions, but we still have 15 uh, layers. It was actually really quite rare to see a layer, any layer except a layer with one or two from the boundary to disappear, they survive for very, very uh, long times through this experiment. So the question is, what are candidate mechanisms for this form of layering that we're observing? Well, of course, we all like to think about, uh, about linear theories. So let's, uh, uh, so indeed, some people have been prepared to talk about linear theories. Come on. There we go. So what are the cat so we have a very, very clear scaling here for the, once again, the color is the different radiuses. We uh, vary, uh, we can vary the rotation rate, we can vary the density, the overall density gradient, and we look at the scaling. We get a very clear scaling for the depth, of, and we typically, in any one experiment, you've got order 20 layers. So we have a very clear scaling for the uh, layers. It scales like the rotation rate divided by the buoyancy frequency by the geometric mean of the two length scales, the inner radius and the, the gap. Remember, we've chosen a situation, so these are non-trivial quantities. So what are the linear stability mechanisms that we could have? Well, clearly, it can't be Taylor vortices, the instabilities of the unstratified case, because, it because the scaling we get scales linearly with n. So for example, this datum here and this datum here are correspond to n squared varying by a factor of 10, so we vary by a factor of three, and we have a perfect linear agreement. And the taylor, taylor coet flow, unstratified taylor coet flow, the scaling shouldn't know about n, because it's an unstratified rule. So that's no good. But mole maker McWilliams et al. had a beautiful uh, prediction of uh, an instability that can arise in such one over r velocity fields, which was then demonstrated here experimentally by Labar and Legal in uh, PRL, called the strato-rotational instability. 
So if you have such a rotational flow with a linear stratification, you can induce spiral waves linearly in the flow. There are coupling between the inertial waves that you have because of the rotation of the system and the internal waves in the vertical. And it can happen in Taylor Coet, beautiful uh, qualitative evidence of this in a much smaller tank. So, of course, we have a, a, a brilliant uh, a French postdoc, Colin Leclerc, tra trained in the French uh, stability schools. So, he did a, a very complicated stability analysis of our problem, had to go to very high Reynolds numbers, high Schmidt numbers, needed incredible accuracy, Gauss Lobato up the yin yang, and managed to work out this uh, stability boundary would find at relatively small eta, you had mode one dominated. And then interestingly, right at the 10 centimeter radius, I should have pointed that out, that corresponds to eta equals 0.417. There was a changeover to the m equals uh, zero uh, mode being predicted the most unstable mode of linear theory. So great, we have a linear theory. Unfortunately, the clear scaling is that it goes like this eta by one minus eta to the half power, which is the dashed line on this figure. And once again, that's another one of these uh, uh, comparisons that's almost but not entirely completely unlike the theoretical prediction, right? This is the experimental scaling, and that is the theory. It's clearly not stratorotational instability. This is a case where the linear instability tells us nothing about the layer formations that we see. Okay? So... Let's think about a scaling argument. Okay, so we have this clear scaling, the, as I said already, omega over n by eta by 1 minus eta. Now, like what uh, uh, Christabel was talking about, you'd expect, like the zigzag instability also gives this, obviously the scaling should go like u over n, we have some characteristic velocity in the system, we have the buoyancy frequency, we're saying it's very strongly turbulent, so that is going to give you the scaling. But what is the right U is the question. Now, if you think about the balance of forces, you have this cylinder that's spinning around and has this really energized boundary layer. It's in immediate vicinity. And so, therefore, it will be throwing out parcels of fluid if it's strongly nonlinear, firing them out. And so the characteristic centrifugal force that is going to be involved in that is the inner radius by omega squared. just comes directly from this scaling. And it's got you, that parcel that you're throwing out has got to go a distance uh, delta r. So the work it's got to do against pressure to be fired out is going to scale like ri omega squared by delta r as it's shot out. Now, as it's shot out, it's then going, and it's in a stratified fluid, it's going to get to the outer wall and it's going to lift itself up, right? And so then it's going to be working against, uh, uh, it's going to have some potential energy it's got to do. So how high can it lift when it's got out to that far wall? Well, the conversion to potential energy it's going to do if it goes a distance h is going to be vertically is n squared over h squared. n squared by h squared, sorry. It's just simple scaling argument. So this predicts if this is the, this has got to be the same balance that has got to be enough to pay for this, it will then tell you what the biggest h you could have and it should therefore scale like this, which is omega h squared should scale like this, omega squared delta r by ri, divided by n squared, which is exactly the observed scaling that we have. And so this argument due to Bubnov seems to be very appropriate for this particular uh, scaling that we observe. So that's great. So we see these layers. They appear to be caused by this sort of nonlinear uh, uh, balance between the centrifugal force of throwing parcels off, then lifting, then lifting up in the potential end. They, they meet a new interface. They turn around. It seems all good. So then the other question is, how can we characterize these particular um, uh, layers that develop? How, does the, what is the, how are they maintained? How do they mix and so on? Well, let's think about the, uh, the situation. We have very, very long-lived experiments. We, have, we can see them. These interfaces survive for a very, very long time. And so the flux through this interface and this interface and this interface and this interface, the only ones that are going to matter are the two on the outside. Their gradients are going to get smaller and smaller. But if we're in this steady state, the flux through the, this layer in has got to be the same as the flux through that layer out. So we're able, for any particular density difference, to know what, get a lot of data about how the flux through the different layers go. 
So we could then, we, i.e. Rosie, could do a ton of experiments, ton of measurements at different times. As the density jumps get smaller, corresponds if the experiment is purely two layer to time changing. And so here it collected experiments where, the, where it was initially two layer, just to add two layer. We started off with one fluid of one density, one fluid of the other density. And uh, so then those are the black dots. With the filled ones are these dynamical, inter initially linearly stratified cases. Those are the field symbols for the different radii. And the open symbols are when we artificially started off with layers that we filled the tank with so that we could then see we have this uh, flux. It's a universal flux law, and it has the sort of Phillips uh, uh, mechanism at the t uh, when it's for weakly stratified that it goes up and then drops. But then we saw this sort of asymptotic regime, uh, which was reported in uh, Woods et al. 2010, when the stratification was very strong, we had a constant sort of flux. In particular, we never saw this uptick uh, uh, for the flux that, for, that comes from the, the Barnforth, Llewellyn, Smith, and Young curve, the Balsey curve. We never see the Balsey <laughs> curve. We just see that, we see that, and then across, but that is a mechanism from the Phillips mechanism that you can imagine the spontaneous creation of uh, layers. And indeed, you'll see, if we looked at the profile and zoomed up, we saw exactly the phenomenon that uh, uh, Guyer said, that the initially the interfaces would sharpen and then enter a dynamically stable state. They would do the interface, the it would form interfaces and they would get sharper. But then also if we looked at, uh, uh, we then sort of wondered where they ever long, were they long lived and we sometimes would see a situation where, the long li where, a, where a layer would develop and then break in two. So we'd have this layer here would start to develop another layer. So you could have the, the, the particular, and then it would be eroded. You see we'd have two layers here at 50 rotations but they weren't quite strong enough and so then they'd form to uh, one layer. Uh, so we could sometimes see the sorts of dynamics that occurred uh, with the layer disappearance, but that was virtually always associated with being close to the boundary. So we hadn't seen the dynamics of, uh, of the uh, Bumfool et al. paper, but we had <laughs> seen a Phillips-like mechanism and we'd seen the sort of uh, uh, situation that we wanted um, to explain the layers are very, very robust. But the truth of the matter was that Rosie was doing experiments with a relatively slow traverse, and so we were only able to take a density measurement about every three minutes. And typically, this was, we would, there would be 10 rotations uh, a minute, so there was a, a weak frequency in these experiments. And also, as I said, they went on for hours and hours and hours, so she'd set them running with the data and go away. So then when we had a postdoc, the postdoc said, I'll take a video. Yes? I've got a limited time. I need a margarita. Oh, it's 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 very very small. Okay. Very, it, it's it's way down here. It's in, way way down here. You know, the, uh, one by ten to the minus two in this scaling. Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, but, but we don't know. And, uh, you know, th that is the least of our worries, as I'm about to show you. Uh, yes? Do you have a Phillips factor in particular layers? Do layers depend on It's a very good question. And you'll see we kind of have layers, <laughs> as we will uh, now see in a moment. Because then we got a post then postdoc, Pierre, decided, well, this is actually a video of Jamie, but, it, but he needed to do it, to take a video of an experiment. And so we see this is speeded up. This is Reynolds number 28,000. N squared over omega squared is 3. So it's, very, it's to the right of the downslope in the mixing thing. But this is the original state. Now, this is hundreds of rotation periods. And the video is not always at the same time interval. It's typically 10 times sped up, but it sometimes jars. Don't worry about it. It's this experiment wasn't stopped. But look what happens when the layers form. The layers form quite rapidly, and now I'm going to point at a particular layer. See, it's not there, it comes back, it's not there, it comes back, it's not there, it comes back. Is that a loop? It's not, no, <laughs> no, see, no, 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 see the probe going up and down, going up there, comes back, comes back, comes back. 
the layers are there and come back. This is that was just a brief demonstration to show the typical rotation period. And then we speed up the video again. And this is all still, you know, let me sh I could be faking it completely, I suppose, but it would be r rather bizarre of me to do so. And your cylinder is absolutely vertical. Right? Absolutely vertical. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the same data in a slightly different fashion. We're going to take a line here through the, the, the pixels of data here. And we're going to take from all the thousands of images and make a very, very long image that would be terrible to print, like a Bayou tapestry of experimental nightmare. <laughs> and then we run a ca effectively run the camera so that it goes past. So you see the d data set here, 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 okay? So that we are taking, so that you can see how it evolves with time. So let's show you, this is this video, right? So we start, we've taken the central streak from the cylinder image of the shadow graph, and we run it across this way. And so you see these layers. And they're there, and they're not there. And sometimes they're sloping. Relax. <laughs> Wait, give it a give it a <laughs> that, that so far, you see that, you know, the long, long, the long video. Yeah. Okay, so they definitely are sloping, right? See that guy there? But let's just wait it out. Now, I'd say that guy really isn't sloping anymore. You see? But, the, but there are several things that are really, see, it's not sloping. And once again, this is different data. And look at how periodic it is and how phase locked it is. And what you are observing, when you see this, this is interface, and this is not interface. So this is interface because you see the shadow graph, and they're not interface, and that's the loop. So you see this on-off behavior. Rosie actually did find this, but not from the, from the video. You have this on-off behavior of the interface, but they are really robust and come back again. And the signal is really periodic. Uh, on that particular video, they're migrating upwards. And there is an a somewhat of an asymmetry between the two, top and bottom. We do put a layer on, the, there's a disc on the bottom, and we put a disc on the top that's polystyrene. So they're not perfectly the same. So there is some communication coming in from the bottom, but sometimes they're tilted, and sometimes they go horizontal. They change, the, change their angle. Now, the period is, the power is really, this is, a, this is taking the Fourier transform of that signal, looking at the power. There's a really strongly peaked frequency for those uh, uh, on-off uh, events. There are approximately five rotation periods. It's definitely mode one. It's a single thing that's going round. If we roughen the inner cylinder, we reduce the period, uh, period time. Here we've done the, we did a smooth inner cylinder with the open symbols and a rough inner cylinder with the solid symbols, and you see the period changes. And the scaling, though it's more scattered for the time scale, for the period of this, is really that characteristic velocity on the bottom and the gap width on the top. So it's like there is some structure, mode one structure, that is associated with going out in this uh, tank. If you look at it, so let's, and it doesn't matter actually whether you do this in a 20 layer experiment, a one layer experiment, you always see this periodic mixing event. It's whether you have multiple layers, whether you see the coupling from interface to interface. So here's a video showing an interface, an individual interface. And then you'll see, then comes along the mixing event. You see, very because it's a shadow graph, it's clearly an interface. And then it's not an interface. And, oh dear, the interface is gone. And then, you know, it was around 72 centimeters. And then she comes back again. It's amazing. And you see this, uh, this one is perhaps hard to see, but you can come and see later. You'll see striate, if you come and look over on my video, you see striations uh, of the structure. There is a sort of helical structure to this uh, thing that's going much slower than the flow. Remember, this disk is rotating at one, and this thing is rotating round, when we see it visually, at one-fifth to a good approximation. Now, if you look at the pictures of the inner cylinder, you can see that there is indeed fluid being thrown off the, the inner cylinder. And so the boundary layer is ejecting fluid, and, but we don't know why there is such a robust nonlinear wave in this system 
that couples from interface to interface. We have no idea why that uh, uh, particular uh, phenomenon has happened. Let's see some more uh, uh, data. So what we then thought was, let's try and numerically simulate this particular uh, flow. So here's a numerical simulation at Prandtl number equals 1, uh, and at lower Reynolds number using Mark Avila's 3D um, uh, taylor Coet code, but stratified. And you see, at early stages, you start to develop these layers. And I've noticed the int interest of time. I'll try and uh, zoom on in the video. Oh, can I do that? No, it doesn't look like Oh, I can't do that. OK. I screwed up on that. Let's not. Uh, let's turn off the mirroring, because then I should be able to do what I want to do. Because I'm over time anyway. <laughs> OK, so if I go to later in this video, look you have a really, really strong layering dynamics forming. And you see what happens? You spit stuff out, and then you don't. Spit stuff out, and then you don't. So there's this constant ejection with a periodic structure of a turbulent flow that forms these layers and appears to be associated with this, this coupled snakeskin dynamics, which we don't really understand why. We don't understand it yet. We call it snakeskin because it really looks like a snakeskin. If we put the picture, we take a snapshot of this particular picture. And it appears to be completely unrelated to the SRI instability, which we thought for a while it might have been, because it doesn't matter. It, there can be, the stratification can be completely well mixed in each of the layers, and you still see some coupling. But there may be tunneling. So what we do here is, we run the experiment for 200 rotation periods, seeing the lag between these neighboring uh, uh, layers. It's 100 in these uh, units. We then stop the experiment. We then run it another 100 times, stop the experiment. Another 200 times, stop the experiment. Another 200 times. The, the lag is incredibly robust and incredibly re attracting. No matter how, what stage it is, we stop it, we start it, we stop it, we start it, we ramp it up slowly, we ramp it down slowly, we always detect this particular lag, characteristic lag between the different layers. The only way we can suppress the lag, but there is a critical distance they have to be together, if we move them apart, they no longer couple. So if we artificially start with the layers too far apart, typically it was about, there were a order 20 layers, if it was about seven layers, i.e. three times as far apart as these, you know, 10 centimeters or so, they didn't couple, and then the, you had these mixing events with exactly the same period, but they didn't couple. We have no idea why it's happening yet. So, there's my conclusions. Layered stratification appears to be a generic attracting state in this flow. The scouring drives mixing and inevitably introduces these sharp interfaces. It's an inherently nonlinear dynamics that gives us these layers and interfaces. Nothing to do with double diffusion. Nothing to do with any linear instability. And the key concept is that we seem to have this very, very regular scouring sort of mixing that gives us these uh, sharp interfaces. It appears to be associated with an ejection from the boundary layer of stuff being sent across and scouring the, the layers. But it then s seems to couple or create, uh, the chicken and the egg, we have no idea, a m equals 1 nonlinear mode. And that, if you have multiple layers, can phase lock in a very, very robust and not understood way. Bill has already asked me the question that I don't understand. What regularizes the interfaces? We have no, it doesn't seem to fit any natural viscous scaling you could have because we, we measure the same thickness of the interfaces even when we Reynolds, vary the Reynolds number by a factor of three. We should be able to detect, you know, the square root of three. We should be able to detect a difference of 1.5. We can't. They're always the same. We don't know what sets the peak flux and we actually don't really know what sets the scale of the layers. We know it scales with this flinging out velocity idea, the balancing the forces, but it's 0.2 times that, and we don't know why it's 0.2 times that, and that is extremely robust across all the different situations that we have uh, tried. So, thank you very much.